Child. A quote from Howard Schultz, which greatly describes the Indo-Japanese relationship on how they kept shoulder to shoulder to collaborate with each other for the greater security of the Indo-Pacific region. I welcome everyone to the second session of the first in India-Japan Summit under the initiative of India-Japan Business Forum. Politica and Concilium Research Institute is extremely joyed that each one of you took out your valuable time to attend the meeting for addressing the relations between India and Japan. The second session will be on the Indo-Japan, a strategic partnership towards a free, open and inclusive Indo-Pacific region. The areas of discussion will be understanding the objectives, principles and significance of Quad in the Indo-Pacific region, describing India-Japan India relations as key pillars of stable and secure Indo-Pacific and the aspects related to uh, India-Japan collaboration for an open, free and inclusive Indo-Pacific. I would now like to introduce our convener, Major General Dr. Rajan Kocha sir. Before asking him to open, uh, before asking him to give his opening remarks on the issue, Major General Rajan Kochar, Vishya Seva Medal, retired from Indian Army as Major General Army, uh, Major General Army Ordnance Corps, uh, Central Command, after 37 years of meritorious service to the nation, alumni of Defense Service Staff College and College of Defense Management, he holds a doctorate in emotional intelligence and is a reputed expert on logistics and supply chain management. General Kocher, a prolific writer and defense analyst, has authored four books and invited as an expert commentator by various news TV channels. He's a senior advisor with, def with defense research and studies and member of Manoj Parikar uh, Institute of Defense and Strategic Analysis and Center for Joint Warfare Studies, New Delhi. He is a former Dean NIET and is now a faculty with them. He is now a NLP coach practitioner. I would I would now like to ask Dr. Kocha sir to address the delegation sir please. At the outset, it's a pleasure for me to have such a distinguished panel who's going to discuss our close relations with Japan. We have a general GD Bakshi. You, he merits absolutely no introduction. He is well known to all of us, a strategic thinker himself. General Satish Dua, another eminent personality whom we have heard a lot and we shall be hearing his views today. And Mr. Ajit, he is a retired IPS officer. He has been with uh, Interpol and he has uh, served a lot in the Northeast, especially tackling the uh, in, uh, insurgency there. He is also an expert on uh, geostrategic affairs. Uh, coming to the summit proper, Japan is known as the land of the rising sun. And what we have seen, the growth of Japan in the coming years since it got its independence has been phenomenal. Today we are commemorating 70 years of our diplomatic relations with Japan. Our relations with Japan have been growing steadily over the years and especially after PM Modi uh, took on. He has uh, visited Japan five times uh, since he took over as the Prime Minister. And it is uh, therefore uh, very evident that uh, how much importance he attaches uh, to the relations with Japan. Uh, we have a very special strategic and global partnership with Japan. <coughs> the three words itself would make you realize special, strategic and global uh, as to the importance of uh, this uh, summit today, especially in the first uh, session, uh, uh, we had a number of ambassadors. Uh, we also had ambassador Sanjay Kumar Verma, who is the present ambassador of India in Japan and we heard him 
and uh, we, we have noted because he had he has requested us that whatever you deliberate in this forum uh, uh, today all those inputs if it can be given to him because that will uh, help him in uh, formulating a closer uh, interaction with the japanese but today we are more concerned in this session with a free and open indo pacific uh, we have already a uh, foreign and uh, defense ministerial uh, meetings uh, 2 plus 2 which was last held in new delhi in uh, uh, november 2019 uh, without uh, dwelling much i'll come straight on to, to the quad uh, the indo a pacific oceans initiative was announced by the prime minister in 2019 and uh, uh, it dwelled upon a free and open indo pacific and this is what we are going to discuss uh, today uh, deliberate upon how both the nations can contribute uh, to improve their uh, cooperation uh, collaboration in the i am indo pacific because uh, this region is getting uh, militarized and the balance of military power needs to be restored here so it is important on what kind of initiatives our two nations can take we already have a number of defense initiatives like dharma guardian Uh, Malabar 2020, JAMEX 2020, uh, PASEX, and uh, a naval exercise uh, Milan, uh, which was held for the first time. So uh, these are a uh, kind of initiatives where the navy and the air force of both the nations are getting together. And furthermore, we. and this the collaboration with them in the unmanned ground vehicle project and robotics we we have a lot to learn from japan and we have a lot to give to japan so basically it is a a win win situation for both the countries and finally the indo japan vision document 2025 and we sages urban development sustainable development and the indo pacific development so uh, these are the uh, three strategic areas where uh, both the nations uh, need to move forward and uh, it's very heartening to note uh, recently the uh, prime minister japanese the prime minister has made a statement that japan intends to carry out a uh, 3.2 lakh uh, crores worth of investment in india in the next 5 years uh, so the opportunity is in front of us uh, let us uh, take this opportunity uh, and move ahead okay uh bolna mera kala diary hai wo le i would now uh, request our uh, first panelist a uh, major general uh, gd bakshi because he has to leave so we would listen to him first and uh, to uh, share his views on the indo pacific and quad uh, over to you sir thank you thank you very much indeed for giving me the honor of being part of such a distinguished panel satish and i go back a very long time when he was ma in vietnam and i really look forward to this interaction unfortunately this thing has come up suddenly so i uh, would request to be relieved first now india and japan why do we need to get to badi wali badi wali is to why do we need to get together the simple fact is we have the common threat of a rising and increasingly aggressive china which is making which is making things very difficult for us in the asia pacific we have to counter that power that rising destabilizing uh, influence radiate out from china 
China is today becoming a uh, has is already an economic superpower. Thirteen trillion dollars worth of GDP going up. It is now translating that economic power into military power. We just got the news that the third Chinese carrier has just been launched, and this is in the eighty thousand ton class, matching the super heavyweights of the American Navy. The Chinese Navy today, in total number of ships. Has overtaken the United States Navy. Take a look at the defense budgets. The defense budget of the United States is 801 billion dollars per year. That of the Chinese is 293 billion dollars a year. The latest figures I am told. We have a budget of 77 billion dollars. Pakistan across has a budget of 11 billion dollars. So if you add 293 plus 11, you get to see the kind of challenges that we are facing to our security. we just have to rise up to the challenge we we have no option the major point is that if you want to balance an increasingly hostile and increasingly aggressive and assertive china in the asia pacific indo pacific rather which is the correct term then you india and japan are the only two major powers in asia which can balance the power of china china cannot be balanced if asia in asia if india and japan do not come together that is a fact of life quad is an initiative we have taken a quadrilateral of democracies which includes the united states which includes india includes japan and australia but the simple fact that i would like to humbly point out in all humility point out is america and japan are not really uh, parts of the in, uh, indo pacific region they are they are external powers but great influences if they want to cut costs and leave run they are at liberty to do so the americans have already cut costs and run from afghanistan in a manner that did not inspire much confidence so when we were having problems in ladakh with china two years back apart nobody even expressed lip sympathy you forget about any practical aid but the simple problem is we don't need anybody's boots on the ground india is big enough strong enough to take care of china to take care of china and pakistan together let me say that unequivocally i mean thank god we are we are the world's almost second largest army fourth large uh, fourth largest uh, air force fifth largest navy so we don't need anybody's help we only need help in technology and uh, for that also there are certain amount of you know restrictions that we are facing from let us say when we go to the united states can we get a nuclear submarine on lease no they are not prepared to give it to you they are prepared to give it to australia we want f35s are are the americans going to give it to you no they are prepared to give it to japan they are prepared to give it to europe not to you so you have your your restrictions as far as quad is concerned into how far it can go and what it can or cannot do what quad is doing for you today very palpable is that it is distributing chinese resources it is not permitting china to focus all its massive resources against any one country not against india not against japan not against taiwan not against south vietnam it has to cater for america it has to cater for japan it has to cater for vietnam and other southeast asian nations it has to cater for taiwan it has to cater for india therefore at any given point of time the chinese pla all three wings cannot focus all their resources on one given combat target which by itself is a very great uh, you know benefit that we get just by being just by having quad in being we dissipate chinese resources we divert chinese resources in multiple directions thus not enabling china to focus its enormous resources on any one single country that is the chief benefit of quad as i see it. we have to go beyond that benefit because like i said 
uh, India and Japan have deep historical roots going back to the times of the Buddha and possibly even earlier. Most of the Chinese gods are Vedic gods, Lakshmi, etc. You see, there is a lot of commonality between the two cultures. Very deep civilizational bonds, right? Then they have been strengthened in recent times. It's not just ancient history. In the Second World War, Japan greatly weakened the British Empire. Because of the Japanese offensive, the British Empire took mortal blows and it could not recover. It had to then relinquish its hold on India. Even more, Japan helped Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose and the INA, which if you go by the transfer of power archives in London, you see what the British uh, functionaries of that period are saying. They left largely because of the pressure, military and psychological put by the INA. The INA trials shook the British Empire. What shook the British Empire even more was the was the was the was the uprising in the Royal Indian Navy in 18th of February 1946. It is that which shook the empire, and they decided to pack up their bags and leave because there were 25 lakh, 2.5 million demobilized Indian soldiers who had fought the Germans, the Italians, the Japanese, beaten them all, and there were just 40,000 Gora Sipai, and there were chances of a revolt. So the British decided to cut their costs and run. Though they won the Second World War in 45, they had to leave in 47, just two years later. And that was because of the pressure uh, exerted by the Indian National Army, which had shaken the loyalty of the Indian troops to the Raj. So that was courtesy Japan. We have a lot to thank Japan for. We also help Japan. We all know of Justice Radha Binod Pal and how much he is respected for his judgment uh, against the war crime trials, in the war crime trials. So India and Japan have strong bonds. Right now, our national interests coincide to a degree which is unprecedented. Unprecedented. And therefore, we must cooperate. If we have to balance the power of a rising and increasingly aggressive China, we have no option but to cooperate and cooperate very closely. I would like to humbly point out that unfortunately the bureaucracies are coming in the way. The bureaucracies, you know, we wanted to get the amphibious aircraft from Japan just to get the military cooperation going. So far we have not been able to get it. Even to the Japanese firms I had, uh, I had appealed, this is not a commercial transaction. Don't treat it as a commercial transaction. This is a civilizational bonding, a military bonding, which is a must. And our bureaucracy also put every single obstacle they could, despite the prime minister wanting it, that amphibious aircraft still hasn't come in. You know, it's deemed too costly, this, that and the rest. But it's not a very good start. The Japanese have the Soroyu class submarines, which they are now going to sell to the Australians. We need more submarines. Why can't we cooperate in the manufacture? of submarines. The Japanese are developing a fifth generation fighter, so is India. Why can't we cooperate in the development of a fifth generation fighter? The Japanese have excellent mine sweeping vessels. We need mine sweeping vessels. Why can't we we'll try and do them jointly? India has produced a world class 155 millimeter Hobitzer in the A tags. It's another thing that the army for a long time resisted the introduction of this. This gun just by the way, for my Japanese friend, this gun has a range of 48 kilometers compared to the American equivalent gun of 45 kilometers. Right? That range is important because you can stay out of range of the enemy and uh, blast the hell out of him. So it has a range of 48 to the American 45. It has a rate of fire of 5 rounds a minute to the American guns 3. So India can share this technology with the Japanese. We can, uh, we can export these weapons to Vietnam, Southeast Asian countries, Philippines, Singapore, uh, Malaysia, etc., Indonesia, all these countries are now buying Indian weapons. They have, they are going to take the Brahmos, Vietnam wants it, Philippines wants it, they want the LCA, they want the Akash. So to that, we can add the 155 millimeter Hovitzer. This will give us economies of scale. If we jointly build military equipment, India, Japan, 
South Korea, etc., then we can affect economies of scale across this whole uh, kind of a, this thing and have a kind of a uh, virtual NATO kind of a thing going at Eastern NATO. And we focus more on the Asian members of the NATO rather than, uh, you know, uh, it's a great thing if America helps us. It's a great thing if uh, Australia helps us. It will be very good. But the simple fact of the matter is that we are not very sure. We are not very sure given the kind of help that we got in when we were facing the Chinese in Ladakh. We were not even given verbal support. You forget about it. We are now being asked to take moral positions. Who took a moral position when the Chinese were bull trying to bully us and they got it back? They got it back and they will get it back again. India is strong enough. But it helps if you have allies and you have friends, particularly allies and friends in Asia. I have a very radical uh, 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 suggestion to offer. You know, India and uh, India and Russia had signed the Treaty of Peace and Friendship, under which, if there was any threat, nuclear or otherwise, to any of these two countries, we were uh, we were to hold mutual con uh, consultations to remove those threats. I say, give that sign those Treaty of Peace and Cooperation with Japan and with Vietnam, two countries which are really going to help you. These are Buddhist countries, and we as a the originator of Buddhism, civilizational bonds, we would not like these countries to be threatened with nuclear weapons or other weapons. So we should go and have a treaty, peace and friendship treaty with Japan, peace and friendship treaty with Vietnam. You lead these countries if it comes, push comes to shove with China. Like I said, if nothing else, they will tie down certain amount of Chinese forces. <coughs> tie down certain amount of Chinese forces. I'm talking horse sense as a military veteran who has fought in 71 war, fought in Kargil, done CT ops in Punjab, in Kishtwar and in uh, Rajauri and Punch. I'm speaking for military combat experience. A lot of our armchair strategists today, uh, I mean, haven't heard a shot fi fired in anger. Right. So I'm speaking from a military background because your threats now are military. The Chinese Navy is going to be a five carrier Navy. The Chinese Navy is bigger in numerical terms today than the United States Navy. So you got serious problems coming your way. The Chinese Air Force has really expanded and it has got almost 1,500, 4.5 generation fighters. It also has fifth generation fighters. So I think we need to cooperate with Japan. Especially India is weak today. We need to gain autarky in critical weapon systems. We need to gain autonomy in critical weapon system. Our problem is we are building ship hulls. We are building, building aircraft, uh, but we have a problem with aircraft engine, tank engine, ship engines. This is where Japan can help us. The Japanese engines are some of the most efficient and best. Engines. We need to cooperate with Japan. We can build the airframe. They can mate the engines to it. And we can take help, their help in improving our engine technology. After all, we have taken in a number of Japanese cars and uh, Korean cars, and today we are exporting them. Japan can shift its manufacture out of China into India. We can make new supply chains. We can link up with Taiwan to have the chips manufacture, a lot of it offshore to India, what they are doing in China now. If China is going to attack Taiwan, then Taiwan might as well, you know, offshore its uh, chips production to India. So there is a lot that we can do, and especially India and Japan are, are Asian countries. They cannot cut and run from Asia. They'll have to stand up and fight, and they might as well do it together because of our deep civilizational bonds, because of our deep historical bonds. And because of our shared mutual interest, we are both democracies, we both face a threat from China. That is adequate cement to join the two countries together at the hip. And if we don't do it, we are heading for very dangerous times. Thank you very much for a very patient listening. I'm sure my colleagues uh, will add uh, and there will be value addition in their discussion today. And I do think we need to develop people-to-people -people relationships with Japan. We need to develop military-to-military -military ties with Japan. 
there's only satoru nagao poor fellow who ca- keeps coming and going and is a big bridge between the two civilizations we need to enhance this people to people contact we need to enhance the number of students that are in japan it's just 40000 today you compare that with the united states japan is going to be your strongest asian ally natural ally please deepen your bonds with it please strengthen bonds with it especially technological bonds jai bharat jai hind thank you very much sir a very uh, insightful sir and uh, certain aspects which you have deliberated upon i think we need to focus on that is the military to military cooperation especially in the uh, submarines mentioned in the fifth generation aircraft you mentioned the engine technology and uh, it is going to be a two way uh, process because uh, we also have uh, brahmos to give to them akash to also uh, is also there and we have already uh, uh, giving to the philippines so uh, why don't we extend it to the japanese also and we can uh, get a lot from the japanese and two important aspects which you have actually mentioned is uh, one is a people to people contact i think that matters a lot in cementing this relationship even further so we would uh, like to give certain inputs to, to our ambassador in japan to uh, work on these aspects uh, maybe cultural programs educational programs uh, student to student programs to actually uh, uh, further this uh, in, in aspect and of course uh, a treaty of friendship and uh, a peace which you actually mentioned uh, that would be a very uh, far thinking uh, needs it to be debated uh, needs to be assimilated by the government that uh, it has uh, immense payoffs in case we go in for uh, such a uh, arrangement uh, with the japanese as well as uh, with vietnam thank you very much sir for your valuable uh, time you uh, gave to us uh, i would now like to invite uh, lefin jal uh, satish dua to give his views on the indo pacific on the quad and anything you would also like to comment on what uh, general bakshi has said you know, over to you sir so can we have a just a very small introduction about satish dua sir Shubham will add on just one minute. Shubham, please the introduction. Yes, sir. Uh, Lieutenant General Satish Dua, sir, retired. PVSM, UYSM, SM, and VSM retired as the Chief of Integrated Defence Staff. As the Corps Commander in Srinagar, he planned uh, he planned and executed the surgical strikes in Kashmir in 2016. A counterterrorism specialist from uh, 8 JAK LI, Siachen. he has operated extensively in the jnk and the northeast during his four decades of service he has also been a commander instructor and the india's defense attache Just in vietnam cambodia and laos uh, i would like general dua sir to address the delegation sir please uh, thank you uh, ashish for a very generous or a very warm introduction and uh, i would like to thank uh, pcri general coach sir thank you very much for inviting me and uh, general bakshi sir uh, i have a complaint uh, against you uh, you make my job very difficult how can anyone speak after you if if you have to <laughs> speak on the same topic uh, so um, and um, as always i found your views very uh, invigorating new innovative and one has a lot to learn from all that i will try not to repeat things which have already been said uh, only to sort of draw on them or add on to them if if there is any requirement uh, so general bakshi has covered the cord the chinese uh, threat in being and the arrangement that cord is following and has the potential to follow uh, very well 
uh, I'll try and uh, concentrate a little more on India Japan first and then come on to uh, issues of court. <clears throat> Actually, uh, the India Japan relationship has got a big boost last month itself when the Prime Minister, Prime Minister Modi, visited Japan for court summit meeting. And then in, in his meeting with the Japanese Prime Minister, agreed to uh, a fair number of enhancements in our relation, which is a very good thing. But we also know that uh, our relationships with Japan have actually seen uh, a fast forwarding, if I may say, over the last decade or more. I remember in uh, General Bakshi also mentioned that I was DA in Vietnam uh, from 2005 to 8. I was there in 2006. You know, those days, uh, uh, the Japanese had not really come out openly to indulge in military cooperation. They were still uh, being innovated on that. And I remember in 2006, the first Coast Guard ship that went to uh, Japan for a ship visit, uh, first weighed anchor in uh, Ho Chi Minh City in uh, Vietnam. And I learned then, they were there for three days, then I learned then that they were actually starting the ship visits with uh, Vietnam. And thereafter, there's been no looking back. Between our two countries, uh, the joint declaration on security cooperation between India and Japan took place in 2008. Uh, various, there are various frameworks of security and defense dialogues, including, of course, the prestigious 2 plus 2 ministerial meeting between the uh, foreign and the defense ministers of both countries. This started only three years ago in 2019. We have an annual defense ministers dialogue. We also have uh, an exchange between the defense secretaries for some reason um, i mean those practical reasons or perhaps not being able to match times it is not taking place every year but otherwise the mechanism exists and you know whenever a mechanism exists it uh, it leaves a great potential for us to be able to draw on it when required whether to sort out an irritant or to enhance our cooperations it's not only at the higher level we have service level annual staff talks i mean there is army to army stock uh, staff talks there is service to service there are navy to navy and air force to air force level staff talks each of which are five to eight years old so this is this is process which has matured fairly not only this like i started telling about talking about the coast guard because uh, the uh, sdf of uh, japan has a very active Coast Guard, even for that, the Navy. So, so it is their Coast Guard with which our Coast Guard level annual dialogue has was started in 2006. I'm talking of the visit that I uh, formed part of it, where they were in Vietnam. In uh, now last couple of years, after Prime Minister Modi has visited and has had summit level exchanges several times with Japan, and we all uh, have heard about that and we know about it. In 2020, we signed an agreement on reciprocal provisions for supply and services. Now, that's a very uh, important agreement, uh, which resulted in the armed forces and the self-defense forces of uh, self-defense force uh, force of uh, Japan signing the AXA in uh, 2021. That was the acquisition and cross-servicing arrangements. Such arrangements really add a lot of enabling teeth. Uh, there's a lot of potential. Like I started saying that, you know, we have uh, our relationship has actually started adding teeth to it or started getting being fleshed out in earnest in last one decade or less. Uh, initially, you may recall that we had a lot of issues between India and Japan. They, uh, I mean, apart from the being Buddhist countries and they helped to I, uh, Indian National Army, etc. But then there came a phase when we conducted nuclear tests and there, thereafter there was <clears throat> uh, quite a uh, cold treatment between the two countries for some time. So today, uh, one is happy to say that there, there are no outstanding differences between the two countries like General Bakshi and several other speakers before brought out. It's today we our convergence of interests is nearly complete as two democracies at the other end of uh, either end of Indo-Pacific. <clears throat> uh, in fact, talking of the nuclear issues, it's, uh, it's you know which had cold relations for some time. In 2017, we have signed an agreement uh, for cooperation and peaceful use of nuclear energy. 
So there have been several uh, exercises, exchanges in the past decade, joint exercises in the Navy. Uh, I think General Kocher also brought out we have PASEX, which are passage exercises. We have JAPEX. We uh, have regular Malabar exercises in which we do it either bilaterally or under the court. We are also now exercising with all the other navies. I just want to make a point here. Practicing interoperability actually lends to our being able to operate together when required. Otherwise, we don't understand each other's languages. We don't understand each other's drills when ships go and practice together, even if they do some innocuous maneuvers. They help both the seamen, the sailors, the, uh, the officers understand each other in terms of their drills, procedures, languages and way of doing things. And that is something which is very essential when you have to do even an innocuous thing like HADR. If you have to cooperate, you really have to understand how each other uh, uh, their assets operate. <coughs> um, apart from I will not dwell too much on the fact that their in investment in our infrastructure like highway bullet train clean energy all that has been has been covered but what is of importance is the japanese fdi especially for the startups and why i mentioned this in security setup is a security discussion over here is <coughs> because it also has some potential for us japan is changing their laws that will help uh, defense cooperation that will help the, the principle for defense exports. It was decided last year will be revised. It'll, it, it is lifting ban on export of lethal weapons. You know, that was another very uh, important factor which we don't talk about that they could not be interacting with us on exchange of um, weapons and equipment. So now they're lifting ban on export of lethal weapons uh, after they have formulated a national security strategy. By the end of this year it's likely to be complete and by next year, by March 2023, this law will be uh, amended and the draft already has it that India <coughs> is amongst the 12 countries to which they will be able to uh, resort to defense exports. So, uh, so India, Indo-Japanese Collaboration in defense manufacturing will really be good for both countries. It will give a uh, fillip to the Japanese. Japanese want to develop a ecosystem in defense manufacturing. And to India, it will give boost to Atam Nirbhar Bharat uh, in, in, in the defense field. So to which uh, our government is really applying itself a lot. And we, uh, we have been seeing a lot of changes have taken place. A lot of steps have taken place in that direction. So that will be a very symbiotic relationship can be a very symbiotic relationship between India and Japan going forward. Uh, <clears throat> the the bilateral exercises that we carry out are not only uh, limited to uh, Navy. I spoke the Navy is takes the lion's share, but we also have that the Dharma Guardian exercises which have held uh, between the armies. Uh, that is the Indian Army and the Japanese Ground Self-Defense Force. Uh, this was conducted in Warangte once and once in Belgaum. Uh, similarly, we've had an Air Force to Air Force exercise uh, called uh, uh, Shin, Sh, Shinyu, Shinyu Maitri. Uh, called Shinyu Maitri. It's a HADR exercise disaster relief operations that were conducted a uh, couple of years ago between the two Air Forces. It was done here in India and in Uttar Pradesh. <coughs> so. India and Japan on the bilateral relations, we are moving ahead. But India and Japan in the defense relations are a comparatively newer, uh, a newer dimension. And uh, one is happy to report and note that actually a lot of changes are taking place, which will stand to, to our, our benefit in any case in, in every, every field that we can think of. One point in this connection I want to mention before I talk about COD is that military diplomacy is a very powerful tool which is not used well by our country. In fact, in especially in East Asian countries where I've, I've served in Vietnam, Cambodia and Laos, uh, the three countries that I was defense attaché in and I have seen that in countries where army 
or defense forces hold a eminent or a preeminent place position it military diplomacy can actually drive a lot of issues and can be should be exploited to uh, to good use for uh, bilateral cooperation and defense needs so <clears throat> i just wanted to make this point because this is something going forward if we are going to have de better defense cooperation with japan military diplomacy should also be plugged in to our bilateral relations quad we all know that quad is four democracies general bakshi brought it out very well i mean everyone knows about quad no one wants to hear uh, anything new about uh, uh, anything from me about quad but i want to point out one issue that we all know that china's hunger to expand to even not this uh, limit itself to a rule based order at times uh, and it's being blatant in many many realms and many dimensions is what has brought some nations together created a dynamic that like general bakshi very nicely brought out that china cannot apply itself to one particular power country or a democracy so it will have to dissipate its resources and spread itself a little thinner so while all these countries india included do have a common goal but what i want to remind everyone and we all have to keep in mind that india is the only country not only in quad even otherwise the only country that faces china in both dimensions we have a continental shelf and we have a maritime dimension because it is in this indo pacific realm that we are facing him in in maritime domain but across the himalayas whether it is ladakh or dolom plateau earlier few years earlier and and we keep having those small incidents here and there all across the 3500 km long lac so we are facing china in the uh, continental dimension as well and in that general bakshi also said we are by ourselves india is capable we have shown it we have shown it twice in in the recent past in dolom as well as in ladakh that china did not expect how resolute we can be and we can actually in a couple of months mobilize enough forces to match his forces in a mirror deployment and now this is the third summer and counting that we've held them to that place we've fast forwarded our infrastructure development in fact last month itself i i was in ladakh and i went to all several uh, areas that we uh, talk about on a motorcycle and on a horseback but i have uh, on my own trip but the fact is that you get a better understanding of how things are panning out there and how our soldiers are holding on so here we should not expect help i know i'm repeating things that have been said but that that bears this bears repetition in our own uh, continental shelf in ladakh in on the on the land frontiers across himalayas we should be by ourselves but in quad there is sense in cooperating with all the four powers and there is already a talk of quad plus there is already a talk of some loose other arrangements if taiwan is not a member of quad but if something else happens maybe this arrangement is going to uh, the, this is not an alliance it's an arrangement it's an agreement so we should let the flexibility remain there is no point making it my suggestion is there is no point making it like nato i mean we can keep calling it locally but today uh, the russia ukraine war has shown that the organized structures unions uh, treaties sometimes don't uh, don't hold ground when it's required the un is proving to be so ineffective in actually any real crisis it is only these arrangements that work out what is helping uh, ukraine is an association i mean it is happening from nato countries fine but there are countries that are helping ukraine this is such arrangements will come up as per requirement and similarly we also don't have to give quad in a name we don't have to we are four pillars but depending on the situation we can rope in others for a particular need based uh, operation or requirement and as we all know quad is 
supposedly not a defense arrangement. We also understand this dimension and we know that it will take place. But Accord is looking after so many other things. General Bakshi has already mentioned that whether it is climate change and all environmental issues, whether it is supply chain management and resilient supplies, logistics, or it is uh, uh, HADR that is humanitarian assistance, disaster relief. So many other even for even for COVID, it was a huge. It's a huge platform to cooperate in such things and in transfer of technologies. That is where uh, General Bakshi hit the nail on the head. We need technologies. We will be able to do things by ourselves. But under this arrangement, if we can get better technologies and here I would like to point out the fact that uh, my illustrious predecessor who spoke before me has already covered that our R&D with Japan can actually be symbiotic. We need those kind of things. He spoke uh, the high tech the engines that you spoke of in all three uh, dimensions, the aircraft, ship and um, uh, vehicle engines. We, we, we require cooperation in uh, AI, artificial intelligence. We require cooperation in unmanned aerial vehicles and unmanned, especially from Japan, in unmanned ground vehicles. These are the fields that we in semiconductors and chips. So we require such cooperation going forward. I set great hope in the Indo-Japan relations as we go forward, especially in the last uh, year or more, the kind of relaxation that are coming through and the kind of push our Prime Minister is giving. If, if I'm not wrong, we've had five such exchange visits in summit level uh, ever since Mr. Modi became the Prime Minister. So if we are going to have such kind of push given right from the top, and I don't recall who one of the speakers earlier before me did mention that uh, normally it is the private sector that drives things. But here we are noticing that government level uh, interaction is is really setting the pace. While at, at, at the FMCG level and the cars and automotive industry and many other things, we see all Japanese products uh, flood the Indian markets and we are very happy to use them. I, our automotive industry was uh, revolutionized by uh, the Maruti Suzuki, a place which is not less than two kilometers from my house. And I see that energy every day with thousands of youth uh, getting in. But the fact is when the government step in, we should expect real fast forward and a very substantive content that will help will be a symbiotic relation will help both but today at this juncture we are looking to be able to leapfrog our defense technologies and with japan's help hopefully we should be able to do that thank you very much so can you kindly mute yourself Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you, Jan. It was, was uh, uh, very enlightening to listen to you. And certain important aspects uh, which have emerged. Uh, one was a conversion of the second aspect which is uh, mentioned was about the FDI. About the FDI. Uh, 42 billion US dollars of FDI has been invested by uh, uh, Japan and India. Uh, Japan has got 11 industrial townships in India. Uh, Japan has got approximately 1500 branches in India. So we have to build up upon this for the very important aspect which you have mentioned, uh, Make in India and Art Nirbhar Bharat. It could uh, uh, go a long way. As a matter of fact, it could be a force multiplier. So we need to uh, develop on that. A second important aspect which you have mentioned is about the military diplomacy. We uh, need to exploit this, uh, uh, make it a part of a foreign policy. And uh, especially our DAs in uh, various countries would uh, contribute a lot uh, towards that. And uh, uh, finally, you mentioned about the Quad. Uh, we have uh, uh, Indo-Pacific uh, economic 
the framework of prosperity in which 13 nations are there today. It has been announced the month of May by President Biden. So, uh, this is a very strong economic uh, framework which can counter China. And uh, Japan and India are a part of this uh, framework, apart from Indonesia, Vietnam, Philippines, all those countries are there. So, we uh, need to build up upon this uh, framework, as also mentioned by Jal Bakshi, in case we want to pose a strong counter to China. Thank you very much, sir, for the excellent uh, inputs you have given us today. I would now Thank you, sir. like to invite our last speaker of the day, Mr. Harjit Sandhu, with his vast experience of international exposure. He is the one who has spent a large part of his life outside the country. He has been able to assimilate a lot. Uh, what uh, India can do as uh, far as uh, uh, its relations with the other countries and over to you, sir. <coughs> thank you so much, uh, <coughs> General Rajan Koshar, and thank you to PCRI for giving this opportunity. Now, what they, I have been given what they call as graveyard of the speakers. The last session, when when everything that you wish to say, that has been said, and then people also have listened the same, and then they think that what more now can be added. So, I will I will start with the uh, slightly taking from the previous speakers, and then we'll see what is left because now, as uh, General Sish Dua said, that there is no fun of repeating the same what has already been said. So I, I will start pick up uh, because I have been taking notes while all the three were speaking. General Rajan started very well by giving the background and but one point which I picked up, we need to learn from each other. Yes, definitely. And I think we need to learn more from the Japanese than they need to learn as far as the learning part is concerned. I, I talked, for example, uh, or okay, I'll put this point along with that General Bakshi's point that people to people contact. That is how you learn. I have dealt very closely with uh, my colleagues from National Police Agency of Japan and JICA, that uh, Japanese International Cooperation Agency, as well as their anti corruption uh, agency during my Interpol days, as well as subsequently later on. Now, one thing we need to learn here as Indians, every Indian is the police is the most respected institution in that country. When you do survey, you ask which officer you like the most. They will not talk of a teacher. They will not. Of course, they, are, they like everyone. But on the top is the police. And in India, I need not say where the police comes on that. I leave it at that. So this police to police, like man learning from there, there is an anecdotal evidence, which I think is for again for everyone to learn. I will come to this specific topic later, but I'm just so that at, at least create a gap between before we come out of what we were discussing on uh, on this uh, quad and other things. We'll come to that. So there is an anecdotal evidence there that in one of the factories, the staff was not given bonus. So as a protest, what they did, everybody collectively, they decided that we will work half an hour more every day. The productivity increased so much that the, the company had no option than of its own increasing. Look at what, how the protests happen in our country. I need not say again. I have seen it as a police. Officer, I have dealt with some of those uh, this uh, nuisance uh, land order problems. So again, we need to learn a lot from that one. Now, another point, uh, General Bakshi said that uh, there are a lot of tabletop experts and strategists. That I definitely agree with that because we all share platforms with some of them, and those sitting in air-conditioned conferences hall talk of. Uh, 
the ground realities and they also talk of how to counter terrorism and all that so def again i agree with that another point he, uh, of course general stish dua covered everything whatever was left by general gd bakshi so he did not leave anything virtually for me but i will pick up from his few things that uh, de- like nato we should not have definitely when it comes to then you have to defend yourself no one defends because you have to defend and someone bilateral agreements are the ones which have been working more because these one quad also he mentioned and then uh, co- uh, cooperation in uh, in industry and general stish dua gave example of maruti suzuki yes that was very good one but uh, let me share with you that i did that investigation in cbi of corruption the resulting from that maruti suzuki starting and some of the top level people involved in that were investigated the highest in that setup so we can get from them something but at the same time we also have to tackle the corruption part on our part because they the corruption you don't see corruption in uh, japan even though they have anti corruption agency and lot of that but our when a scheme comes i i cannot share details about that maruti investigation because we went all the way on heavy industry and lot of senior people so again that is where we need to learn military diplomacy and all everything is covered i'm not uh, repeating i try to i noted down so that i don't have to repeat i wish you know every speaker in such forums uh, prefers to be the first one because then you can put your thoughts but i have no regrets on that because uh, the real stalwarts spoke before me so i cannot talk of what they spoke but some of those things re- missing as general bakshi said our relations with japan they go back not only historic even prehistoric times there was something yaoi yaoi tombs 300 bc in japan they found that glass beads originating from india were found there and the historical time during Bud- buddhism he mentioned that we have to deal uh, i mean coordinate with japan and vietnam because of buddhism and all i have traveled to all those areas by the way i was in laos also in uh, in thailand burma all that region during so many years i have covered that and there is a lot of buddhism in that so bodhi sena in 752 ad was the first one recorded then indian independence movement ina we all know i was in manipur i have seen that moirang memorial where the first flag was hoisted by 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 ina then world war 2 we changed of course we were uh, british part of british empire so we became bit of enemical but then when this international military tribunal for far east started since i studied this all the proceedings all records of this because when we started when i started working with the international criminal tribunal for war crimes in former yugoslavia so we read all the records of uh, nuremberg trials and tokyo trials to understand how the things tokyo trials we used to call it as victor's justice you win and you hang everyone from the other side whereas in war it is always two sides or more than two sides to the war and he also mentioned about justice radha vinod pal we don't recognize him that much in india but japanese have a shrine in his name they have a road in his name whose judgment and those who do not want to read uh, lengthy details of the trial proceedings just watch a netflix movie of 2016 by the name tokyo trial our famous actor irfan khan is he has acted for justice radha vinod pal is worth following his arguments and the way so india japan relations continued during that time even though we were part of that then it comes to when india got independence maybe they, some of us will know but not everyone that japan was amongst the first nations to recognize indian sovereignty amongst the very first one recognizing it and then as a result of that to say thank you india sent 
to uh, two elephants to the tokyo zoo to cheer up the people because they had suffered the war and they had lost in the war so to cheer up india sent two elephants then started this 1951 india did not go to attend that francisco san francisco peace conference because they thought japan sovereignty will be challenged only when on 28 april 1952 then this official diplomatic relations were established so when we talk of 70 years of this is 70 years of the latest diplomatic relations but not the previous ones previous ones we have all along been having it so that comes to the historical part now since everything has been said i come to the very basic go back to the actual topic of today the today's topic says a strategic part partnership towards a free open and inclusive indo pacific region I, i go to the basic subject line now if we see the indo pacific region all those 24 25 countries right from australia bangladesh brunei all those our neighboring and between these uh, two oceans this region is facing since a lot has been said about uh, military side i am not covering that i'm taking the general one now even though i had i had it all in my notes but it is better if about uh, military strategy a general speaks rather than a policeman or a retired policeman or so they are more uh, like hands on experience so this region is facing several challenges such as piracy terrorism proliferation of weapons of mass destruction natural disasters and attempts to change the status quo that we have seen our biggest neighbor keeps on all the time trying to with us also and with japan with vietnam also some of the island so these are the challenges and india and japan as two leading powers in the indo pacific region previous speakers mentioned about that they have a shared interest in the safety and security of the maritime domain freedom of navigation and overflight unimpeded lawful commerce and peaceful resolution of disputes with full respect for legal and diplomatic process in accordance with international law a key for stability and prosperity of the international community in indo pacific is a dynamism that is created by combining on two continents that is asia which is rapidly growing and africa which has a great potential so it is linking two continents and two oceans two oceans free and open pacific ocean and indian ocean if this region is having this free open and inclusive system i think it covers most of the world literally on this in this region and the three pillars on which it is developed will be promotion and establishment of the rule of law freedom of navigation free trade pursuit of economic prosperity that is improving connectivity and strengthening economic partnerships including free trade agreements and economic partnership agreements and investment treaties then commitment for peace and stability capacity building on maritime law enforcement humanitarian assistance and disaster relief cooperation etc and this can be done by showing respect for the global commons i just put it because what has not been said and those now coming to india japan those who have followed the evolution of the partnership they know it very well that it enjoys a great deal of resilience and a change of prime minister does not easily change its course if you see over the years japanese prime minister ministers have changed but each one has kept this policy of closer relation with india because it is in their national in their strategic interest as well as it is in our strategic interest partnership with india has now become a crucial element in japan's foreign policy 
some analysts in some articles they mentioned that uh, the when the previous prime minister suga he took over and while greeting foreign dig dignitaries soon after assuming office he first called the indian prime minister modi earlier than the president xi jinping of china no this, this may be coincident but those who analyze these things strategically they think that 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 means he gave more importance to that even though J japan is trying to put always trying to make efforts for china to to like sort out all their problems with the asean through peaceful negotiations because this uh, i think it was uh, general stish duwa said that uh, there are two ways we should sort out an irritant or enhance cooperation so i think these two countries india japan is trying to do both we are trying to sort out an irritant and at the same time also enhancing cooperation no another thing i thought maybe which i can mention what are the issues collectively india and japan can deal with in the coming years continuing to deal with or can deal with the very first one is north Co of course china we have discussed a lot i'm just going through my list which i noted one is north korea's destabilizing ballistic missile launches in violation of united nations security council resolutions since i was i worked as a united nations security council on the panel of experts for five panels i thought i put it on the top in my list then they need to collaborate closely to realize peace and stability in afghanistan because we can't have this whole region peaceful and free for our trade and other things if these irritants we have not sorted out while enhancing cooperation using general duas word we also sort need to sort out these irritants so we need to collaborate closely to realize peace and stability in afghanistan and stress the importance of un security council resolution 25993 where like where they say that no country should allow them to use their territory to carry out terrorism activities and they should continue expressing the concern at the threat of terrorism and need for strengthening international cooperation the situation in myanmar i was there in the rohingya camp uh, two three years back there are 1.2 million refugees in that and lot of that talk was that few of them have become radical and they are spreading terrorism and india was affected and all i'm not going into because that is a whole subject into that but again myanmar also needs to be sorted out if we need this peaceful area then the current ongoing conflict and humanitarian crisis in ukraine whichever side we support whichever side individually we support this needs to be sorted out because this impact is everywhere everything is becoming expensive people are dying without taking any side then at present india is holding the un security council's revolving presidency for the next two years in august 2021 india got that and they got extremely high number of votes i think 182 or something out of 190 something like that the figure was around so please try to conclude in the next two yeah minutes. yeah sure i'm coming to that then another point india india needs to continue supporting japan for the non permanent seat at unsc after for the next one and then uh, of course this uh, i think it was my last one only on the nuclear non proliferation treaty also they both have to so that india has continued use of nuclear energy you know general question when you are the last one you you try to put your thoughts into what is left and what is not left so it is really with that i conclude but putting it that cooperation it needs we both need each other this is my concluding part that india needs japan japan needs india and that is the whole focus of this and thank you thank thank you very much for this time and uh, i i hope i did not repeat too much and on the quad of course just my last one on the quad is again general bakshi and general dua both said that 
it is not something like military they will not support each other because even australia had once withdrawn under chinese pressure and then rejoined it so this is more like a strategic alliance even if you read in the wording it says it is believed that this forum strategically counters china's economic and military rise so this is the wording so it is basically for that only and with this i close thank you very much pcri thank you general rajan kosher for uh, inviting me for this and to other co panelists thank you very much thank you thank you very much sir uh, for your uh, comments and especially you uh, spoke about uh, Japan's support to us for a permanent seat in the United Nations Security Council it's very important to us and secondly the stand which Japan has taken in particular uh, reference to Ukraine it has not criticized india's support to russia it has focused on diplomacy and dialogue as the way forward so that is also important to note and of course uh, as you rightly said that uh, the people to people uh, as we become closer to each other i think the relations will improve further the key takeaways from this deliberations we have had in the last uh, more than one hour has been uh, the importance of military to mi uh, military uh, cooperation the importance to uh, collaborate the importance to share technology because so japan is got abundance of technology it has a, a move far ahead than india so uh, it would be a great idea to get this technology into india and uh, since japanese have got enough of foothold in india and from the past experiences we can draw out uh, from uh, their industry especially submarines uh, where we lack that uh, technology uh, fifth generation aircrafts and uh, in the field of artificial intelligence uh, quantum computing blockchain uh, robotics uh, these are the areas where we can get into a, a closer focus with japan and uh, as jordan dua brought out there is a need of an ecosystem of defense manufacture to be inculcated in our country and this ecosystem of defense manufacture could also be taken to japan so if both these countries develop this ecosystem of manufacture and there is a exchange of ideas information people flows i am certain uh, things can move ahead and lastly coming to the quad part it is important to understand that quad can only be a success if the bilateral relations between each country of the quad are improved and for this i would like to highlight here uh, since a quad 2.0 i will call it because quad was formed almost a decade earlier but it never moved from where it was it was only in the last 2 years that quad has really become relevant so i can name it quad 2.0 in this quad 2.0 you would have seen the number of time the australian prime minister has met the indian prime minister and how many times uh, is, is we are uh, 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 two plus two meetings have uh, taken place as also japan so you can see and of course the us is there uh, in india is in constant interaction with the us so you would have uh, seen there has been a definite 
a positive shift in the bilateral relations between India, Japan and Australia and the United States. So this has been a, a great, uh, uh, I can say, uh, uh, impetus to the movement of court because only then the court can gain relevance. One important aspect which was brought out by all the speakers is the emergence of China as a major irritant in the Indo-Pacific Ocean. And therefore, this economic framework of nations which has actually come up, 13 nations, this needs to be strengthened today. If we have to dissipate the uh, economic power of China because it is difficult to work on its military power right now because uh, as brought out the PLA Navy is getting stronger uh, uh, by the day the third aircraft carrier is also uh, come into its arsenal. So we, we must have a counter to the economic uh, progress of China because unless we have a counter to that I don't think we'll be able to tackle China. And uh, today uh, we have a huge trade surplus with China. We, we are uh, I, I am importing uh, more than 100 billion US dollars from China. As a matter of fact, uh, China is our biggest trading partner. So this has to change. It cannot be business as usual, as we say. So with the times to come, I think with our a focus on bilateral relations because bilateral, I will again stress, it is the most important uh, area where you can push things. And uh, here I would uh, like to take on a suggestion from uh, General Dua about uh, military diplomacy also coming into play. We have long neglected this uh, military diplomacy and it's a time that we dovetail it with the foreign policy, as I said earlier, and uh, use it effectively. And uh, for that, I we have uh, wonderful people here uh, who are experts in uh, military uh, diplomacy. And I would uh, make appeal to the government to uh, use the services of our eminent and experienced uh, senior officers of the armed forces who would be able to uh, share their experiences of their uh, DA tenures outside and give uh, uh, an impetus. As a matter of fact, I would uh, like to uh, tell PCRI to take it on in your next uh, seminar. You have a seminar on uh, focusing on military diplomacy as a tool of foreign policy, uh, something like that. And uh, please invite uh, three eminent ambassadors and uh, three eminent veterans of the armed forces. And uh, one representative of the Ministry of External Affairs. It's important. And if you have a forum like this, I am sure we will be able to focus on uh, these issues in a slightly uh, better manner. I said at the end of this uh, summit, I want to thank each and every speaker, each and every eminent uh, personality who spared his valuable time. And I am, and I know how uh, uh, busy you people are today and uh, grace this occasion of ours gave recognition to PCRI and the kind of importance you gave to him to accept the invitation we extended to you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, have a good day. Jai Hind. Thank you. Thank you, Rajan. And, uh, thank, thank you, you General Rajan. Jai Jai. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Chief Dua. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. All. So. Thank you to no, our no, co-panelists. No, co no, co no question. Eh? They said, we have 
I mean, deliberated enough, so we will work on all that uh, inputs what we have got today. Yeah, Thank excellent. You. Thank you very much. So before going, let me give let me give you a quote because you, you I think most of you, you know, uh, Kosher and Jana Dua particularly talked about artificial intelligence where we share that. You know, we talk a lot of artificial intelligence, but they say that most of the organizations suffer from two things. They have two challenges. One is artificial intelligence and the second is, you can guess it, natural stupidity. So while we are dealing with artificial intelligence, we also need to deal with our, with the Natural stupidity. Thank you very much and all the best. Okay. All the best. All the best. Thank sir. Thanks okay. a lot, sir. It was a lot Have of a nice day. Okay. Bye. 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 I call it off. Yeah.